Tom has been here today, hasn't he? Yes, he and is. And he didn't invite my wife and me up <laughs> once for a cup of tea. <laughs> did he? <laughs> but what was that like? I mean, were you ready for that? I mean, did they prepare you for, for that kind of fame? What would you mean to curtsy in front of the Queen? Like yeah, well, that, that and just, I mean, everything, you know, you walk down the street, you get your picture taken, everybody has posters of, of you up in their, their bedrooms, you know, pining away. I mean, it, it was an amazing thing, and, you know, uh, I, how, do you, how do you prepare for that, or how do you deal with that? It's quite difficult, because at the time, I was looking for someone to love as well. <laughs> and, um, we were looking for you too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late. <laughs> and, um, and it was crazy because certain times I had people that were literally parked outside on the garden in front of my apartment and they just used to stay there the whole week or two or three weeks waiting for me to come up out. But um, I managed to handle it in the end, I think, so that's all right. And um, mm, mm. it was all right. It was all right. Mm. Yes. And what happens when, you know, I don't, I don't mean to be bleak or anything, but what happens, it's just, I'm just curious, when that's over, you know, is there a withdrawal? Do you move on? What, what, what happened? How did you find yourself after that? Um, how did I find myself? Um, I just tore my hair out. It was terrible. And then, where it was torn, I went back into the hairdressers again and got them to put a hairpiece on, which I had dyed a very fetching shade of Titian red. How about that? Good? Yeah. That's what I did, and I tore my hair out. <laughs> okay. okay. Mm. Dad, did you get to go to the Oscars that year? No, because we were given the Hollywood Golden Globe instead. Oh, yes, you, talk about that. You won the Golden Globe for yes, uh, Best yes, Movie. Yes. Did you get to go to that? Do you know what? No, we didn't. We didn't. But they did send us this nice thing, which I still got. And uh, that was good, yes. We, we didn't actually come over to do any promotion for the Oscars. Is it just me, or was it a really lousy year for films this year for the Oscars? Believe me, I'm with you on this one. Really? It's absolutely shocking. It's, it's the first year that I have no passion for any of the movies. You've always got passion. For <laughs> no, I have nothing for, no. for anything. But I have passion a little bit more about Romeo and Juliet, okay. which we do have passion for. So I, this movie also uh, was post-dubbed, um, that you did it and then you, you did the dialogue in the studio. Um, if I'm correct, that's what I've read in the newspapers. Was that what fascinates you about that? Well, it because, because first of all, that's not usually a, an English-speaking kind of thing. Usually in English-speaking kind of movies, they have the actual dialogue on, on set. And it's very Italian. I mean, Olivia actually talked about um, next door, they were doing the dubbing for Fellini Satyricon, and she got to sit on Fellini's lap and be Giulietta Messina. And it, it's a very curious thing, and interestingly enough, when you listen to the record, it's different than actually the, the dialogue in the movie. So, you know, it's just, it's, it could be more spontaneous or it could be less spontaneous. Did you find? Um, well, I think that uh, it's very underrated because, um, is that a gun? Is, is that a laser that you're pointing at me? Oh no, no, it's the bottom of the... I thought maybe I did something wrong or something. <laughs> no, it, I absolutely adore dubbing. And funnily enough, she mentioned Fellini. Fellini did something really strange. If he hadn't quite worked out a scene, he got the actors on the set just to say A, B, C, D, F, G, H, O, J, K, L, M, N, P, Q, R, S, T, and then write the dialogue in later. But I found that, because I was still very unsure of my speaking voice, that, that dubbing was fantastic because I could, I could correct some of the bad, bad sounds. And I absolutely love it, I really do love it. And Franco said to me there was a particularly long piece that he wanted me to, uh, to dub. And it was about six or seven lines or something. So um, he said, oh, this is very long. I said, no, I'll do it in one, one take. He said, no. Darling, don't be so stupid one take. So I said, no, I'll do it in one take. So he said, no, it's impossible. I said, what will you give me if I do it in one take? 
So he mentioned a figure of money which was very small, but probably not much bigger than the amount of money that Olivia and I got paid for the film. And anyway, I did it in one take easily, just like that. And I said, right, where's my money? He said, I was only joking. <laughs> um, but I enjoyed doing, the, doing that dubbing stuff. Mm. What about the other, I, I particularly love in this movie, um, two actors, Pat Hayward as the, the nurse, and you have a wonderful scene with her, and also Milo O'Shea, who is a great uh, actor. And, uh, talk about, uh, if you can, working with both of those. Um, well, it's, it's weird because if you're in any kind of business, you always get have a favorite, which is, I suppose, very not very nice. But there are two people who I've met in the profession who I absolutely adored, and Milo was, was one of them. He was a typical Irish, you know, gentle, lyrical, sweet, nice, lovely man. And the other guy who I think is also one of my favorites is the guy I mentioned a bit earlier, Derek Jacobi, who is a sweetheart, really a lovely man. And uh, Milo told me an interesting story because uh, um, you know the Irish and drinking. He said that he was on a wake once in Ireland. <laughs> and he said what they used to do is take the, the, the coffin and just go on the pub crawl on the way. <laughs> And he said they all arranged it all day, all arrived at the, at the cemetery, and they looked around and they said, I don't know where we've left the coffin. <laughs> they were all so, you know, drunk. Um, and he was full of lovely stories. I remember one day, because he was, he was actually doing Barbarella at the time as well, yeah, doing some outtakes. And he was living on the, uh, on the sand in Frigeni, which is just outside of Rome. And Olivia and I went along and I said, uh, Milo, have you got any wine for us this evening? He says, okay. So he, he got out a bottle of Valpolicero or something, which we, we demolished in about five minutes. <laughs> anyway, so Olivia, I said, come on, let, let's go and do, um, was it suddenly last summer on the, yeah, on, on the beach? So we, we went out there and started playing that scene and everything, and um, the waves were coming up and everything, and, and, and Milo shouted for us, where are you? I said, what's the matter, man? He said, can you imagine I'm going to be in a lot of trouble if, if they think that I actually, when I'm supposed to be taking care of you, allowed you, Romeo and Juliet to drown at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but he was a lovely man. Sadly, he passed about, about a year ago now. And he was just, he was the kind of man that he walked into a room and the whole room just lit up with his gentle sweetness and compassion. Loved him. But Derek is also a really, really fine, lovely man. Anybody here seen Vicious? Yeah. 